the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegand, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heike when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heike? Thus the village of Centerville became Heike. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish, but when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Heike. Two miles west of Heike, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heike and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Grover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heike, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. Okay, go right ahead, Kathy. Good evening. It is September 11th, and we had a rainy day today. Um, and this is the Greater Centerville Oral History meeting, and this evening we are going to have Richard uh, Wiegen and Keith uh, Schutte talk about the uh, I-43 fight. And um, I live at County Trunk X in Newton. That's on the way to School Hill. And because we have a historical day today, 9-11, Five years ago is when the Twin Towers were bombed. And uh, Don and I were, when this happened, we were getting dressed to go to the, get a CAT scan to see if his chemo had worked or not for the first time. So we okay. found out if he was gonna live or die that day too. Okay. So I remember very well. Okay, thank you, very good. And who do you have here, please? Irene Dine. I live at 915 Polk Lane, Cleveland. Okay. And what were you, what do you remember on that moment when you heard I about five? I was at Pomp's Tire having a new tire put on my car and I was sitting in the lounge watching TV and I saw it right okay. from the start. Okay, very good, thank you. And who do you hear, please? I'm Alice Mathias, I live at 1018 <coughs> Juniper Street and I don't just remember what I was exactly doing but I know I stayed wired to the TV all day long. I'm sure you did, yeah, <laughs> thank you. And who do you have here, please? I'm Willard Mathias, 1018 Juniper Street. I had about to sit next door watching the TV. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rooted right to the TV. Okay. <laughs> and who do you have here, please? Uh, Fred Jacoby of Manitowoc. And um, I was helping a friend to move pianos that day, and we had just finished uh, taking a grand piano apart and loading it in a trailer to take it to Green Bay, and his wife called on the cell phone and said uh -oh. what was going on, so we put the radio on on the truck. Okay. Very good, thank you. And who do you hear, please? Melvin Yaney, and I was going to get the mail when I heard it over at car reading. Okay, very good, thank you. And who do you hear, please? John Wiegand, South Union Road, Cleveland. I was working by Jack Schnelly that morning, as I always was back in those days, and <clears throat> we had just finished milking. We had the radio on, as we usually did, and I heard that the one trade tower was hit, and I didn't understand at first because I was going back and forth from the chores. Sure. What had really happened, I thought it was an accident. Maybe it, okay. something blew it up accidentally. Yes. And it wasn't until the second one was hit that I realized this was not an accident. Right. This right. was planned. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? I'm Kate Schutte, and I live on North Avenue in the town of Centerville. And I was working at my job at, for Kiefer and Company as Human Resources Administrator. And our sales representative came flying in. He had been out on the road and, and announced it. So I went to the computer and okay. brought it up. And then I saw the second one also right. as it was recorded. And then had the responsibility of, of telling my coworkers, the manufacturing people, and, what was going All of those, on. Yeah, yeah, as as a human resources person. Right. It was a, a very, very sad day. Yes, it was. Thank you for sharing. And who do you have here, please? Uh, Richard Wiegand from, uh, well, now from Spooner, but originally from Town Centerville. <laughs> um, I had just come back the day before from Cuba. I was on a trip with the Madison Sister City Group. And uh, I went to work on Monday for a while, but I was a little... I was a little tired from the trip, and so Tuesday morning I decided to, to sleep in. And I got up about 8 or something, took a shower, turned the TV on yeah. in the house at 8.30, and the first uh, plane had struck. <clears throat> and uh, the news media 
was showing this tower on fire, but they didn't seem to know either what was happening. And then all of a sudden, they were showing, and then the second one hit. Yes. yes. And I called the office to tell them that this was going on, and they said, oh yeah, we got it on on the radio. And uh, I went in, I think, a little bit before lunch or something, went into work that day. Okay. Um, Jimmy Kettler, who lives in town Centerville, uh, told me that he was coming back from a trip overseas and he was transferring from Kennedy Airport to LaGuardia uh, trying to get a taxi or something like that when that all happened. So he got stranded in New York, but he apparently saw the second one hit uh, live. So oh, really? I was talking to him one day and that's what he said. Wow. Well, well, um, yeah. yeah, that was a unusual day. And you, sir? Eugene Moiser from 1575 Coney Lane Road. Yes, sir. The day that it, it happened, I happened to work at B and B Metals, and then they come over the radio. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. And you, you sir? Walter Chris, East Washington. And uh, we were eating breakfast, and my wife called me in, and I happened to see a second plane hit the tower. Wow, wow, so that was a sight too. That was a sight. Yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Then. You, ma'am? <laughs> Marie. I'm Marie Pipper. <laughs> What else do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you live, Marie? <laughs> Your address. <laughs> uh, 927 Center Street, Cleveland. And what, uh, when this all happened, or, or, do you remember what you were doing? Or? No, I, I led a sheltered life, so I don't know anything about it. You don't know anything it. about that, huh? <laughs> 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 okay. Edith, and what about you? Uh, you want to Edith. introduce yourself? Edith, let's see, from uh, 695 East Washington in Cleveland. Yes. And I, I saw the plane. I don't know if it was the first tower or the second, but anyway, I, I was getting ready to go golfing that day, and afterwards then we couldn't watch TV neither. We just was wondering what was happening. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a pressurized circumstance in there. Okay, and you, sir? Charlie Bauer from uh, Highway C, Newton, and my wife called me because I was in the shop and I don't have anything on in the shop, yes. so she called and told me what happened. Okay. Okay. So it ended the shop at work. <laughs> that was, you were glued to the TV from yes. that point on, too. We have a late arrival, Jerry. In oh, we do. Okay, yes. I'll cut right here. Okay, we got a gentleman just came in, and he'd like to introduce himself. Go right ahead, please. Rick Firestorf, Town Mimi. And on 9-11, uh, I was working, um, seeing patients, and one of my fellow physicians came in, knocked on the door, and said uh, his wife had just called him. That first trade tower was hit. Yes. And he came back a few minutes later and told me the second one, and then he came back and told me that the Pentagon was hit. So oh, isn't that a lot of news in a short time? Yeah. Yes, it was, it was a very unusual day. I myself, uh, Jerry O'Neill, I was I just returned home from Manitowoc after picking up a few things, and the phone rang. My daughter was on there, and she says, "You got to turn your TV on now." And I did, and as I turned it on, as everybody else indicated, more or less, I saw that second plane hit the tower. And I thought, I asked her, is this a movie or what? And uh, she said, no, this is for real. It's very sad. So that's what happened on my occasion. Yes, Richard, you raise your hand. <clears throat> yeah, Richard Wiegand. Um, John and I went out east on a trip in 1976 for the bicentennial, and we went up to the lookout point, and then I think oh. it was the North Tower. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was the North Tower. Okay. Um, we went to the, whatever it was, the 99th or 100th floor. And yeah. Must be quite there. a vantage point up there. Huh? And I had been up uh, not too long before that. I went up, also went up to the top, and then I decided, you know, we should go up. And then later when I got married, I took my now ex-wife up there too. Okay. And actually, we were up there at night that, that oh. time, so we could see the New York skyline and yeah. all the lights. It was just incredible. Yeah, yeah. So that would have been 1991. Okay, very good. Thank you. And I'll get back to Kathy at this point. Okay, we've got our introductions complete, and Kathy will give us a little uh, update as to what we're going to be doing this evening. Go right ahead, please. Kathy Sixel, and before I do that, we went to New York after the Twin Towers were down, and I thought, like even when I saw pictures today on TV, I thought the area would be much, much larger than it is. I thought it was a small area where they were located at, at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, you should raise your hand when you have information to share, and then Mr. O'Neill can come over by you, otherwise we will miss some of it. Always state your full name, and try and use full names when referring to people. Uh, refrain from using nicknames, and please don't visit uh, when someone is speaking. Okay. And we would like to have Mr. Bauer have the floor for a minute. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Bauer has got something to report, I believe, and uh, go right ahead, please. Yes, Charlie Bauer here, and uh, we missed our July meeting, and at that meeting we were going to give out the information on our fundraising broad fry, and we, I passed the pictures around. I can pass them around again because Dr. Beisdorf didn't see me and pass them back down. And I have the information on the numbers and the amount of money we raised there. And before I get into that, I got to thank Eugene and Lloydie Vogel. They were they did most of the frying and most of the beer drinking for us. And it, was a good, it was a good fun day. <laughs> and uh, we had 180 brats and 90 hamburgers, and we took in $570. And this year we also had a donation jar set up on there, and we took in another $28 worth of donations, and that brought it up to $598. And the unit cost is normally 85 cents per unit, and that includes either a brat and a hamburger, the bun, ketchup, mustard, and onions. And this year, the CR Stop the Mobile Station donated the buns to us, which was a good thing. And they, that brought the cost down to 77 or 70 cents a unit. And after we paid our bill, we cleared $400.72. So I thought that was a, a real that was more money than our last fundraiser. So we had and we had we had a good time there. Yeah, we had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one other thing, in the the Manitowoc paper, the close up. I don't know if everybody's seen the article of our group that I submitted in there. Yes. If not, I can pass it around. Yes, and uh, could you hold it there, Charlie? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have to apologize to Willard because I promoted him to commander, and, and it should have been. <laughs> Past post commander. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Charlie. Sure. And one other thing, I was down to see my sidekick, Dorothy Anderson, here a week ago, and she gets along real well. She's up walking around, talking. Okay. And once in a while, she'll, she's got the word there, but it just doesn't come out. But you can really talk to her nice. And we were, I spent about an hour and a half there, and she walked me down to her, her therapy where she does her physical therapy and her speech therapy. And she misses the group. I, I could see that, you know. Mm -hmm. I told her I'd come down and visit her again. Very good. And I think that's about all I got. I was, I was <laughs> good job, Charlie. I have, yes. I have something to add yet about uh, that, uh, the trade tower. I was up on top of that trade tower with my grandson just in 85. He was just a baby at that time. And mm -hmm. We were all the way up there. And there was a guy there that he was dragging something along all the time. He, he jumped off of the trade tower, but, or he wanted to, but the cops knew what he was going to do and they stopped him before he could jump. <laughs> <laughs> I have some pictures I've, I've taken of myself and the little guy on oh. the trade tower, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Edith. Okay, we have uh, this gentleman raised his hand and he'll identify himself. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Richard Wiegand. Um, I regret to, or I'm sorry to have to mention that Rita Hoon passed away yesterday. And she had come to some of our meetings, and somebody was intending to actually bring her. Uh, Cindy Hoon was intending to bring her along tonight, so she won't be with us anymore. Okay. So, uh, she was our neighbor for many, many years across the road okay. on the Hoon farm. Mm -hmm. um, I went to see Dorothy Anderson not too long, just when she got into that nursing home, and uh, she couldn't talk yet at that time. But her daughter was there, and and uh, so we, you know, tried to make conversation for half an hour and mm -hmm. did our best, but. Sounds glad, like she's improving, though. Glad to hear that, that she's up and around. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Hubert Dersch was down the hall, so I went to see him. Marie and Hubert are there, and Marie has got Alzheimer's, and she doesn't know anything anymore. But I talked to Hubert for a while, and he's doing pretty well for somebody who's 96. And uh, hmm. I asked him a bunch of questions about the village of Cleveland, and he told me about hitting a couple home runs and some baseball games and whatnot. And so he got all fire it up and I didn't have as much time as I wanted to but uh, but it was nice to talk to him and I understand there's somebody else from the village that's also in that nursing home now. Selma? Selma? Oh Hattie, Bo oh, Hattie Bo oh and there, what there's, there's a man too that, that yeah, just uh, Adrian Wagner, Adrian Wagner, Adrian Wagner Adrian is also in that same what is it called it's uh, Morningside, Morningside, Morningside Nursing Home okay so Adrian Wagner and Hattie Vogel, Hattie Vogel and Selma Vogel, Selma Vogel are also and and Dorothy and, really? and Hubert and Marie are all in that nursing home right now. Oh my goodness. And Jen Griff. 
and Jen Gretz. So if you want to make a visit out of it, take a day. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have plenty to do. <laughs> Very good. Well, I'm glad to hear that report. I mean, that, uh, yeah. it, it was good you brought the names. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, other than that, I guess uh, we're going to be starting our main subject core here. And perhaps, uh, Richard, would you like to start out? Yeah, Richard Wiegand, I got one more piece of business. Um, the information that John and I provided at the Saxon Cemetery walk that we had last month, I typed it out so uh, and added a little bit to it. So uh, I don't know, I guess I could just pass this around. It's not really part of this meeting unless you want it recorded or something. But No, but, uh, if you got it, as you can read it right away, that'd be fine. All right. Um, well, we had the Saxon Cemetery uh, walk on August 14th. And the presenters were John Wiegand and Dr. Rick Beiersdorf. And then I put down the group organizers, Kathy Sixler, Richard Wiegand, Gerald O'Neill, and Charlie Bauer. Uh, the size of the cemetery, I stepped it off, and it was 2.3 acres. Um, number of stones, including family and small stones, I counted them, was 411. Number of persons listed on stones who have died, 533, 533. Number of persons possibly buried where stones are missing in the old section of the cemetery, 36. So the actual number of people who could be buried on the cemetery might be 559. Mm -hmm. And this was on August 14, 2006. The family plots began around 1912. And we talked about that, the, the switch from mm -hmm. individual stones to family plots. Uh, the profiles of the persons buried there, I just, I don't know, I was just guessing on this. And uh, I would say they're 100% Caucasian, <laughs> uh, about 98% German. I know there's uh, some Koenigs and a few other people there who are not, you know, they're part German. But, uh, Saxon German, I figure maybe two thirds of them are actually Saxons of Saxon German mm -hmm. descent. Mm -hmm. Lutheran, probably about 95%. Uh, children under 10 years, maybe 15% of the people buried there are children. And I think there were a lot more back in the 1800s, mm -hmm. that whole front section is mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. Accidental deaths, we had 15 and John read them. Um, uh, suicides, we estimated to be about eight. People who were cremated, about nine. Double graves, <clears throat> where there's a baby on top of an adult, uh, I think there's two. And my mother mentioned them and I don't remember who they are. But. And the military veterans were 23. Not all of them are veterans of wars. Most of them are, but uh, we had 23 as military veterans. Mm -hmm. And then the, the persons who died of accidents, I won't read them off, but they're on the sheet. I'll pass this around. Okay, so thank you very much. Rick. That again. Very good. Okay, I guess uh, maybe at this point we are go to the topic at hand. <laughs> okay, I, this lady will give her name and uh, she's got some information. I need this, let's see, and I, I called Zabo Monuments and, and I asked her where the stones came from because that question came up there. And she says they come from all over the world. But she says if you want, it, depending on what color you want, she says every state has a different color of stone. Okay. All right. And we, when you come in and you say what color stone you want, we know where to go. Okay. That's the way, that's what, the way she explained it. Very good. Thank you, Edith. Thank you. Okay, sir. Richard Wiegand, uh, the subject of the discussion tonight is the, um, is the Centerville and other county or other township uh, I-43 highway fight that went on mostly from 1974 to 76. Okay. There was some activity before and there was some that was after that, but the main part of it was basically 75 actually and 76. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kate Schutte is here, and she was the president for a couple of years of the Interstate Alternatives Association, which is the group that we formed to fight the highway. And I was the vice president, and Louise Kerber was the secretary treasurer. These were the people who started as officers, and then later on we went in different directions, and, mm -hmm. and other people were uh, running the organization. Um, so that's the discussion that we're having tonight. And I guess probably I, I did a, a timeline of events. Okay. Uh, and uh, I have an extra copy. I'll just pass that around. People can read that. I'm going to read that into the record here, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Might be a good idea. Um, I-43, highway fight, timeline of events, 1974 to 76. 
Interstate Alternatives Association, our IAA. 1970 to 74, the, the, uh, the other highway fight was I-57 on the 57 corridor over in Plymouth and Waldo, and there was a, a farmer um, over there named Bill Ford who basically fought that one, and, and uh, they, they, they never put it there. So uh, I don't know how long that was going on, but that, I, wasn't, I wasn't in the area uh, at that time. 1974, the U.S. Highway Department designated I-43. They put a name on it. I found that somewhere. Uh, 1975, IAA forms and hires attorneys Steve Winter and Francis Buda. Uh, Francis Buda wasn't uh, practicing law in the, in the state of Wisconsin. He was, he was an international patent attorney. So we had to have a local attorney who was, uh, you know, a, Accredited on the Wisconsin bar, so mm -hmm. Steve Winter, who had an office in Cleveland, I think at Wimler's, uh, was our attorney. Um, yeah, this was in January. We had a meeting at the Classics in their shed, and uh, oh, Classics, was, who's Classic? uh, Ed Classic, okay, on, on Union Road. Yes, sir. And uh, the organization elected Kate Schuette as president. I was vice president, Richard Wigan, and Louise Carver was the secretary treasurer. In February, the Sheboygan County Board voted for the highway, and I, the Manitowoc County Board also did, and I don't have that in here, but they did at some point. In March of 1975, the IAA sponsored 10 open houses on affected farms. So there were, I think it was on a Sunday, I don't remember, but uh, people could come and visit the farms and see the affected farms. There were, I don't have the number in front of me, but I actually wrote down all the names of the farms that were affected, and I think there were 40-some. 40 or 50 different landowners were affected from Sheboygan to Green Bay. Oh. The section of highway from Milwaukee to Sheboygan was under construction at that time and completed at some mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. during that time and, and uh, the highway department was completing the other lake to Green Bay. So we were fighting the, the, the section of the highway from Sheboygan to Green Bay. Um, and our mission was to preserve farmland, that was mm -hmm. the main item. I mean, uh, right. there were a lot of other reasons, uh, but that was the main one. We were angry about farmland being taken because the route of the highway was not going to be on the old highway, which would have cost them a lot more money and a lot of hassle. So they went through the back 40, so they went up and right through the back ends or sometimes right through the middle of farms. Mm -hmm. So that's where that came in. Um, in March of 1975, we did a, a protest march and we walked some of us walked on the actual route over the fields from Sheboygan to Green Bay, and I was the one who organized that. Uh, most of the protesters walked on 141 at the time, but I, Mike Block from Cleveland, he was a teenager at the time, Earl Voss, who was my classmate from uh, Keele High School, and Gilbert Arns walked uh, over the land. Uh, and we crawled over fences and stuff. It took us four days, it was uh, toward the end of March. We wow. got snowed on the last day. We had like an inch of snow on us and we stopped to get some hot chocolate at one of the farms. And then at the end of the day, we ended up at a tavern and the media was there. And somewhere I'm interviewed on the Green Bay uh, and maybe the Milwaukee stations, but mm -hmm. anyway, so we were there. Um, in April, there was a telephone poll that was conducted at Manitowoc and Two Rivers, and I think Sheboygan, and 75% of the people who responded were against the highway. In May, Governor Patrick Lucy uh, was corralled by Ed Klesik, uh, well, I shouldn't say the word corralled, but uh, <laughs> Lucy was traveling, I think, in the area, and Ed persuaded him to stop over at the Klesik farm, uh, at Ed Klesik's farm. and. Um, I'll get to that, I'll talk some more about that, because I was right in the middle of that. Um, in May, Nancy Simmons, who was a strong highway opponent from uh, Sheboygan, she was re-elected chair of the Sheboygan County Democratic Party, and the reason I mention that is because I think uh, she was struggling to hang on, because the highway was quite controversial. You know, people were for it, against it, and it got to be a little mm -hmm. hot, and uh, I think Nancy Simmons eventually, probably it cost her her political life <laughs> I don't know, but uh, she really went out on the limb mm -hmm. for us, and, and uh, so she was around and she supported us and we were very appreciative of that. And then, um, I don't know if it was in May or when it was, but um, I and Knut Anderson, uh, uh, Kate's uh, husband, 
went to debate the highway engineer Charles Ryan on WHA TV in Madison. Okay. And I have tried to get hold of that tape uh, since that time, uh, you know, in recent, in, in the last year or so, and they don't have it arc, um, they don't have it indexed, or they don't, they don't have a record of where it is. They said, yes, we have it somewhere, but it would take us too long to find it. So, you know, if I'd run for public office, I'm sure they'd find it. You know, they'd, <laughs> somebody would dig that out. And uh, it, it was actually a rather, it, it was a very civil discussion. Uh, you know, nobody got argued about anything. And, uh, you know, I mean, we, we're, we disagreed on the highway. That was obvious. And Charles Ryan was the highway engineer from Green Bay at that time. And, and uh, he came to a meeting in Centerville, and he was worried for his life or something at that time. But no, not really. <clears throat> But uh, we, had a, we had a nice discussion uh, on TV. In 1976, uh, I'm missing some events here, but um, uh, Nancy Salm took over as president of IAA, I think in April. Kate left it and, and Nancy took over. In April, the, um, and I wasn't here at the time, I was out in California, so I missed these events. But in April, the, uh, uh, Ed Klesik and a number of IAA people went down to the Madison Capitol with three of Classic's cows and a calf. And they kept them there, I don't know, 10 days or two weeks. They put them in a pen outside of uh, Governor Lucy's office on the Capitol lawn. And uh, of course, they got a lot of attention at that time. And, and mm -hmm. um, my next item is that uh, Ed and, and the people who were there did get a, a meeting with, with uh, Governor Lucy at that time about the highway. And they presented some petitions. They had, I forget what Ed said, they were like, 17,000 signatures or something they presented to mm -hmm. Governor Lucy, uh, you know, were against the highway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also in um, April of 1976, 16 UW professors came out uh, against the highway. They were in Madison. Um, but in May, Governor Lucy authorized the go-ahead for the highway. Okay. And uh, State Representative Carl Adi, I put in here, supported the Lucy decision, and St Secretary of State Doug LaFollette criticized the Lucy decision. Um, on, in June 12, IAA protesters were arrested at the Ken Tesserick Farm Highway section, where they were working with the bulldozers uh, in that area. Um, they had gone out the day before, and Kate can tell you more about it, because she was there, I wasn't there. Uh, but they were arrested trying to block the construction. And the people who were arrested that day were Ed Klesik, Kate Schutte, Darlene Wellner, um, Mary Miller. Um, Darlene Wellner was with the um, League of Women Voters in Manitowoc. Mary Miller, that's Margaret Miller's daughter. Norbert Orth, Bernard and Rita Lesensky, they were farmers up around Denmark. On, on the on the route, Sally Franz was from Madison. 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 Elaine Sharping um, from one of the affected farmers, Rodney and Mark Yankee. They're from the Maribel area, affected farmers, and Mary Ellen Schnelly from uh, Town Mosel. Those were the people arrested. And then another day, I think it was the second day, two other people were arrested and 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 released after the protesters objected to them being arrested because of their age. And these two people who were arrested and released were Carl Klesik and John Hushhagen. And I don't know who John was. He was a friend of Carl's. In June, um, Judge Deere, County Judge, uh, Manitowoc County Judge uh, Deere d dismissed four lawsuits against the highway. We had a number of legal efforts going to try to block the highway or get a moratorium. And these four of them were dismissed um, in July, there was a bicentennial highway protest, and I don't remember what that was about, but I found it. In September, uh, the federal judge, Doyle, ag agreed to hear the lawsuit against the highway, and, and obviously he rejected that later on, and I didn't get the date on that. In October, while they were building the Highway 23 interchange of I-43, there's a, an affected farmer down there named Sigmund Bullets. He was an immigrant from East Germany. Uh, they had a, there was a protest down there, and I remember being on his farm. Um, in December of '76, the trespass charges were dropped, and they dis, uh, against the uh, protesters who had been arrested earlier. I mean, they weren't in jail; they were they were just held for what a few hours or something, and then released. But the the uh, charges were dropped by Judge Miller. 
in Manitowoc, and I did attend that, that hearing. In 1977, uh, I've just got a few more items here. In February, uh, the Classics wrote a letter to President Carter, which was answered by the, uh, somebody from the Secretary of Transportation's office in Washington. And uh, um, Joe DeVark told me the other night that they also wrote a letter, I think, to Nixon. Uh, before that, Nixon was president until the middle of 74, and then Ford, and then Carter. Um, and, in, uh, and then in May, um, Ed Klesik had written up uh, something about his philosophy about the loss of the land and the highway, and that was entered into the congressional record by Bill Steiger, who uh, died not too long after that. He was our congressman for the 6th District. Um, 1980, October, I-43 opened from Sheboygan to Green Bay, and I took a bike trip. Um, a cross-country bike trip, and my first leg of my bike trip was on the on the interstate. In August of 1980, before it opened, it was paved. There was some work going on, but it it, it, it was wasn't open yet, and so I went right down the middle of the interstate with my bicycle. So <laughs> I got to try it out, even if I didn't like it. I thought, well, <laughs> let me do that. So I went to Manitowoc walk on on the I-43. Um, and then in 1982, Ed Klesig was featured on the cover of Eve Arnold's book, In America, and there's a picture in one of these here about Ed being on the cover of this, this mm -hmm. book. He, he got a lot of publicity. Uh, Ed was always out in the front. You know, we were trying to, to uh, you know, mount some, uh, a, a number of uh, angles, you know, to defeat the highway, and, and Ed was always running around, how, you know, Ed is. And, and he, was, uh, he was doing a lot of things. He got a lot of publicity for us. Um, I have a list of people here that I put together that were opposed to the highway and supported the highway, and uh, the supporters are not here to defend themselves, so I hope I don't take them in vain, but uh, it, the more notable people who supported us against the highway, Herb Vanderblumen, who was the Manitowoc game warden, he already was involved in the I-57 struggle, so he was a pretty ardent, ardent environmentalist. Paul Unwin, who was the WQTC announcer. Alan Lassay, the state senator, was, came to a number of our meetings up uh, when we had meetings in Francis Creek. Um, Nancy Simmons from Sheboygan Democratic Party. Ernest Klunk, who was on the Sheboygan City Council. He wrote a lot of editorials on our behalf. Um, Secretary of State Doug LaFollette. State public intervener Kathleen Falk, you know who these people are, they're <laughs> running for running state for office or our state officers. Okay. Um, Bronson LaFollette, who was the, the attorney general at the time and a cousin of Doug. Charles Smith, the Wisconsin state treasurer. Gary Rohde, the Wisconsin secretary of ag. Uh, Nathan Heffernan, who was the Supreme Court judge in Madison. Um, Darlene Wellner. And sisters Thomas Moore and Grace Mickey of the Manitowoc League of Women Voters, Jamie Schaefer from the Sheboygan League of Women Voters, uh, Reverend Dave Stephenson from Green Bay, Judith Heidner from the Two River City Council, Connie Deer from the Menominee Tribe, and then I have Common Cause, Wisconsin Farm Bureau, Wisconsin NFO. There were three polls that were that I read about in the newspapers that were taken, and 60, 80 percent of the public said they were against the highway. Um, so uh, that's you know that's where we where we were at that time. Support for the highway. Um, Richard Susha, mayor of Sheboygan, Anthony Dufek, mayor of Manitowoc, Carl Adi and Calvin Potter, and Francis Lollensack, who were the state representatives in this area. Uh, the Manitowoc Two Rivers Chamber of Commerce, and ultimately Patrick Lucy, although I think he was sympathetic, but I, I, I think he had to, at least in his uh, mind, had to approve the highway. So that's, um, I can pass this around. People want to no, don't. Okay. Yet. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a photograph here of one of the reunions that okay. we had after the highway fight was over. Okay, if you can tip it just ahead a little and bit. And if you want to, yeah, can you get it? I'll have to take it yeah, out of there. I'll, uh,
Again, um, this was a, a, this a photograph of the reunion of the highway fighters, uh, members of the Interstate Alternatives Association. And we had a number of get-togethers, picnics, uh, on a pretty much yearly basis after mm -hmm. the highway fight was over. When was and that picture taken? Like this one, I think, was 1980. Okay. I was just guessing that, but I'm I'm not real sure. I think I was there, and in fact, I'm not sure that I can identify it's myself. It's written on the back. It was 1980. Well, because I wrote it on there. Oh. Because <laughs> I wrote it. On. I put a question mark by 1980. Okay. Um, anyway, the 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 event was at the uh, Francis and Betty Buddha home uh, on Centerville Road, Cleveland, just north of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And Betty is still alive and lives there. Uh, these were not all of the members of IAA, but they represented uh, the, uh, the core group fairly well, I think. Some people were missing. And the, I'll read the, the, the names of the people standing in the back from left to right. Francis Salm, Louise Kerber, Francis Buddha, an unidentified woman, Hildegard Salm, Norman Baskin, John Wiegand, Irvin Schmidt, Leo Cease, Adeline, Adeline Schmidt, Rodney Yonke, Evelyn Karstens, Chris Buda, Elaine Sharping, Bernard Lesensky, Janet Sharping, Emil Karstens, Rita Lesensky, Gilbert Arns, Gerald Heimerl, Margaret Klesik, Paul Gruber, Robert Klesik, Edward Klesik, Richard Wiegand, maybe, Jane Stannard, Angeline Cortens, Carl Klesik, Conrad Klesik, Paul Cortens, Francis, <laughs> Francis Kerber. Those are the people from left to right standing in the back. Mm -hmm. In the front, sitting or kneeling. <coughs> Nancy Salm, Caroline Sharping, Lorraine Kerber, Christine Kerber, Karen Kerber, Ann Dvorak, Karen Salm, Julia Cease, Lynn Dvorak, Joe Dvorak, um, somebody who I think is one of Eric uh, Klesik's kids, John Salm, Mary Ellen Schnelli, Tom Dvorak, uh, an unidentified boy, it may have been a Salm, Lloyd Schnelli, Peter Salm, Joe Brockhoff, Violet Brockhoff, Elise Klesik, Robert Kerber, Kate Schutte, Jim Kerber, Knut Anderson, Mike Kerber, Frederick Klesik, and Steve Wilkie. And the person taking the photo would have been Betty Buddha. She's not in there, and I'm sure she took the photo. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I'll let somebody else good. talk. Good. Thank you. We got a young lady here who is an uh, important part of this uh, uh, program this evening, and she'd like to identify herself and give us some information. Go right ahead, please. My name is Kathleen Schutte. Uh, people call me Kate. And I live on North Avenue in the town of Centerville. I'm still a resident of this, of this great area. Uh, it, interesting, perhaps, to you is that my husband was Knud Anderson. And my involvement in the IAA, the Interstate Alternative Association, and the whole fight against I-43 was due a great deal in part to my husband, Knud Anderson, who was a really close friend and almost a son of the Edward Klessig family, Ed and Margaret. When he first came to the United States, he was from Denmark, Europe. Uh, when he first came to the United States, he lived with the Klessigs for about six months and established a very close tie with them. Uh, when I met Knud in 1970, we very often visited the Klessigs and I got to know them as well. And one of the greatest topics of conversation, of course, was the proposed I-43 site. Um, in the beginning, it was I-57, and I have to say that Ed Klessig was in from the ground up and can't say enough good things about him in that regard. And his involvement with correspondence with official people, and he has that extremely well documented. Uh, Richard was kind enough to come over on on Saturday night and we were looking through things and the classics had released a lot of these papers to him and uh, I was just impressed with with what he actually had done. I want to apologize. I, I have to say that I was in an accident and a, a lot of my memory has vanished. So a lot of my remarks will be more personal than they will be factual. 
in the sense of, or I shouldn't say that they aren't factual, but the uh, specific things. I can't remember dates. I lose track of names of people. But uh, I remember the time well. And also, I have to comment that although Ed was extremely knowledgeable and, and uh, involved and I want to say, I'm searching for a word here, he just had the tenacity, the will to continue fighting. He didn't quit. I tend to be the quitter. He just kept on and on. And because of that tenacity, the issue really came to the fore. Um, that also happened to be one of his drawbacks. And I became involved because of the uh, failure for the rest of the community and the other farmers to jump on board of the fight. And I had a unique position in that my father, uh, Ward Schutte, uh, who was the chairman of the, of the Manitowoc County Highway Committee. So there was this huge conflict there in the family for myself. But it also served as an advantage to uh, show that, I, I guess, the difference there in, the, you know, that here's the daughter of Ward Schutte, who was a road contractor, fighting the highway. And that got a little bit of attention in itself from the press, that why would I do such a thing um, because of my father's uh, position. and. Uh, gave, I think, a little bit of credibility to the cause of the, of the farmers. Uh, when I came on board, it was as a co-president with Paul Unwin. And I can't say enough about him. Paul Unwin was an announcer and news reporter for WQTC in Two Rivers. And he and I sh actually shared the presidency, but he was incognito, so to speak. Because of his position with the press, he, he didn't, uh, you couldn't afford to uh, jeopardize his, his job, of course. Uh, but he was instrumental in getting the news out and creating news and therefore was a, was a great asset to the cause. Uh, he had access to the Associated Press little, I want, it's, almost, it's almost like a tele, uh, uh, yeah, um. a key point thing, like a, like a telegraph or what, whatever. Anyway, but he had access to the mm -hmm. Associated Press network where he could just type things in and off it would go mm -hmm. to, the, to the entire country. And a lot, we got a lot of coverage that way. So I, I can't emphasize enough the imp importance that he had and, and to know that he, uh, I shared my position with him, although he was under the table, so to speak. Um, I, I did not uh, come without some challenges, and one of them it was from uh, Herb Vanderblum, and as Richard introduced him before, or didn't introduce him, but mentioned his name before, he was really suspect because of my connection, of course, with my father and, and my history in the family of road construction. And uh, I eventually passed muster, to, even to the point where he gifted me with this beautiful, uh, green glass wine canister that he brought with his own homemade wine in. And when the wine was finished, he gave me the canister. And I still have that and use that as a base. So uh, I did pass muster eventually. But I had to go through the test. Um, one of the great things for me in this uh, involvement in this was my exposure to the to the government officials and the uh, I'll just start with Doug LaFollette uh, when he invited us and I say that in quotes uh, to bring the cows down it was his idea to bring the cows down to uh, Madison and park them on the lawn right in front of 
Lucy's office. I, it was just a delight. I, I, it just was a great thing. Um, <clears throat> but I had the opportunity. I wasn't president at the time. I think that, that I had passed that on to, to Nancy Salm. But I went down as a member of the Interstate Alternative Association and had my first official press conference and didn't know what to do at all. And uh, Doug LaFala just called a press conference and he said, Kate, you're going to do this. And so I was just thrown into it. So I had a lot of personal first, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, education from these people and involvement. And uh, it served us well in the future with uh, other environmental issues, uh, all of this training that I got firsthand as on the job sort of training. Uh, helped us a lot in other issues. Um, I can't praise Richard Wiegand enough in his involvement with the march. It was a very visible event, of a very uh, emotional event. And it, it was Richard's intent to walk the actual path of the highway before it was cut up before it was paid and he got permission from all of the landowners to do this and that was hugely significant and then afterwards we followed the 141 corridor to have the actual march of, of the members and it was cold and I participated very little because I have trouble walking even at that time I had trouble so uh, these things were done a lot under the under Richard's uh, leadership and uh, very much involved that whole time. Ah, what else? I'm going to throw it back I, to you. I have a question if you don't Okay, mind. just shoot it. Shoot okay. it out. Uh, Jerry O'Neill, uh, as far as during the walk of the corridor uh, that you mentioned, were there people standing in other areas, were they either taunting you or cheering you on, or was there anything like that? I'm going to pass to Richard on that one because I walked very little. Okay. And when I did, the, I walked one day for a part of a day. Okay. And on that particular day, we were just walking and people would pa pass us in cars, but there weren't a gathering of yeah. people rooting us on okay. at the time that I was walking. But Richard okay. can speak to that. I think that there was a lot more at the end of the... Okay, I'll pan over to Richard. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Richard Wiegand, I can't answer that question either because I wasn't walking on the... On, on 141. Okay. And I don't recall how that went. It took us four days. We did about 10 miles a day, 10 or 12 miles a day. So we did it on four different days. You know, we went, came back, you know, got rides, okay. went back home. I actually spent uh, a couple of nights, I think, at, at Joe and Lynn Dvorak's on that, on that walk. So I was out there. Okay. Um, I just uh, remember, you know, crawling over fences and. We were trying to figure out how to get across the Manitowoc River. We got across every <laughs> thing that, that we ran into except the Manitowoc River. We actually had to walk out to a road with a bridge on yeah. uh, because that was pretty wide. That was a little difficult. And uh, we got snowed on, and I just remember being interviewed by the press up in Bellevue at a tavern where we ended up. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of the end of that. I mean, there was a lot more, obviously, going on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Ed and the other people were entertaining the press quite a bit. Okay. on the, uh, the other part of the walk. So I, I have another question, and I'll leave it up to other people also, but uh, in order to get people to organize is not always an easy thing, whether if there's a cause or not. What did it really take to spark the people that had the farmlands involved or whatever to say, I think it's time we get together, I think we got to form a group to protest, if you will, or to provide another uh, route of uh, information. Would you be able to handle that? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. I, I, well, I, I actually don't know okay. how we got them there, but there were about a hundred people there on that first night where when we formulated the Interstate Alternative Association, mm -hmm. which really brought in the farmers, okay. the affected farmers. And uh, that very first meeting, I believe that we got 40 members to sign up right, out, right off the bat. So uh, one of the reasons that it was effect easy, I shouldn't say easy, but uh, that a lot of people joined was that they were personally affected. Yes. 
and uh, there's nothing like having your own ox gourd to bring mm -hmm. you to the fore. Right. Um, I don't know how many members we actually had at the end. I think Nancy Som could speak to that better than myself. Mm -hmm. But we did jump in, I think, with about 40, uh, 40 people who were charter members, so yeah. to speak. Okay. And uh, it was with phone calls. I don't know if we sent out a letter or not. I, I think it was mostly just by phone. All right. Um, but can you, do you yeah, know how I we, can. okay. Yeah, I'll cut right here for a moment. Okay, I guess uh, this gentleman would like to identify himself and provide some additional information. Right ahead, please. Uh, Richard Wiegand. Um, <coughs> Kate's right about, you know, affected landowners. Um, a lot of them were, you know, up in arms about, about the highway. And uh, I think one of the criticisms that we had of the group to some degree was that at least local participation was mostly landowners. Okay. Now, Kate's an exception. Mm -hmm. She's not from a farm. She was from the city yeah. of Manitowoc. And I, we, our farm wasn't affected either. I mean, we were across the road from affected farms. Mm -hmm. um, and I had just got back from, uh, from Peace Corps, and, and I don't remember if it was Kate or Ed. You know, I was, I was becoming an environmentalist, and they said, well, you know, put your money where your mouth All is, is. <laughs> you know, do something. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just remember somebody putting me on the spot, and, and, and she would do that, and, 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 and Ed would do that, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it, I guess that just kind of shook me a little bit, and, and I thought, all right, well, let's, you know, see where this thing goes, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, certainly I believed in the cause, you know, I mean, I, there were a lot of, we had all had doubts about a lot of things, but, mm -hmm. but uh, as far as the membership, uh, there is a list here of charter members. I don't think they're all on there, but we, you know, we would get 40, 50, sometimes 100 more people at meetings. Oh. We had meetings at Classics. We had meetings in Francis Creek at, uh, what was it, the I Hilltop? The Hillside or Hill? Hill, Hill, Hilltop. I Hilltop think. Uh, Inn or Tavern. Politica we, Corners. Politica, yeah, we had meetings there. Mm -hmm. um, I forget where else we, we were meeting, but uh, a lot of people would show up. And uh, we had some really good support from farmers up north. It wasn't just us. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul Cortens and Joe Dvorak and Bernard and Greta Lesensky, they were out there. I, you okay. know, and I've got some literature in a box. I haven't organized it, but Cortens wrote some pretty strong letters to people, senators mm -hmm. and whatnot. And, and uh, so we, you know, we, and, and we got a lot of support, you know, once we got in the papers, we got people out of Green Bay, you know, we had the Reverend uh, from up there, we had the uh, UWGP students mm -hmm. came to our meetings and, and the number of, you know, people came. So um, when I, you know, organized the walk and I went out to see if all the landowners would agree that we could walk, <coughs> I think there were two, and I think they were both truckers who were against us. They nonetheless let us walk across their uh, property. You know, I mean, I'm trying to be a nice guy and say mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do. Um, but they were for the highway, and of course, the old 141 was not a particularly attractive road to drive a semi on. I mean, we certainly no. acknowledge that, no. right. and right. something would have had to have been done with that. But uh, I, I ran into very little opposition in terms of the walk. Um, I will mention, and I talked to Ed Klesik and I talked to Kate, I think about this too, of all of the correspondence that we had, I and I alone, I think, got a piece of hate mail. <laughs> 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 I got one very nasty letter. It had one cent on it. I had to go to the post office to pick it up. <laughs> What's this all about? And I open it up, and it's full of four-letter words addressed to me, and I yeah. just tore it up and threw it yeah. in the trash, but, yeah. but uh, yeah. I maybe should have kept it, but I mm -hmm. was pretty taken by that. But, <laughs> but if Ed ever got any hate mail, he doesn't remember it because he was too busy, you know, mm -hmm. doing what he was doing. But, sure. but uh, I just, just remember getting that, and I was, you know, like I said, I was rather taken back by it. Mm -hmm. um, so, a question. Okay, just yeah. a minute. We've got a gentleman here who has a question. Right ahead, please. Hi, my name is Fred Jacoby, and looking through the book of, you know, all the listings of the people that were involved, uh, I see the county board members and the uh, Cleveland, you know, town chairman is part of the, that was Charles Kramer, 
Uh, and then I was wondering, did the town board, was there a vote on record in support of the road or against the road by the Cleveland t town board, first of all? And then was there one that involved uh, Charles Kramer in the position of the county board member? Uh, did they take an official vote that you're aware of? Okay, we've got a question on the floor pertaining to uh, township and so forth uh, with voting. Go right ahead, please. John Wiegand. I believe that all the boards involved, which would be Cleveland Town Board and the County of Manitowoc and Sheboygan County Board, I believe they all took a position on it. I couldn't tell you just off the cuff what the vote on it was, or, but I, I think all those boards were literally pushed <coughs> by Mr. Klesig and others to take a vote on it, and I think okay. they did. All right. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, Richard has uh, raised his hand. He'll identify himself again. Richard Wiegand. Um, I, I was in reading through the literature, and like I said, I haven't got through all of this yet. Um, but I think Charlie Kramer was was on our side on this. But uh, the two county boards and the Brown County Board, I think, also voted on it. But certainly Manitowoc and Sheboygan. If I remember right, there were probably five, six, seven, eight who were against the highway and the rest of them were for the highway. So, you know, out of 30 some, or there were, we, we, we lost in, in the two county boards. I don't know that the town board ever took a vote on it. I just remember when the, uh, the uh, next major battle that we had, well, there was Safe Haven was there too, but, but when Tom Fries came along with his landfill proposal, uh, Kate and I and Ed and a number of people that had fought the highway were again involved in stopping the landfill and poor Tom Fries, we were ready for him. <laughs> um, because we had learned a lot from the highway fight and we went to the township, to the town board and I think Richard Zill was the chairman at that time, I don't remember. But, um, we went to the town board and we asked them to get on the record in support of our fight against the landfill. And they hesitated for a while. And we put up a slate of candidates because the spring elections were coming in a few months and we had, we circulated a petition and we got 90% of the people of Centerville to sign off against the landfill. We presented that to the town, mm -hmm. and they may have a different version of it, but not only did we have the petition with 90% on it, but we had a slate of candidates that we were at least talking about running against them. They came around pretty fast, you know, mm -hmm. but we, we had the support, we had the local votes and everything like that. And, and I think we did that because I think we, during the highway fight, we probably didn't get the local support, didn't, you know, make enough of an attempt to get it. And I know there were a lot of people in the community who were for the road, but were too polite to say so, you know. <laughs> um, but we were out there, we had this thing, you know, that we thought we had to do, and, and, yeah. and well, we did it. And That's part of being in America. It's a wonderful part. Reflecting back on it, I mean, I just can't believe we did what we did. You know, yeah, we, went, right. we d went through all these hoops, we spent all this time. Yeah. <laughs> And a lot of us, you know, I'm more of a background person. Uh, Kate, so she doesn't like to say she's a leader, but she was a leader. Yeah. I did a lot of uh, background work for the, the highway fight, and that included running up some big phone bills, talking to people, and I read the environmental impact statement from cover to cover. I'm more of a studious person. I don't like getting up in front of people and talking that much. So. I was doing a lot of the background, you know, research and calling people and sending letters and this and that. We spent a lot of time on this. Oh, I'm sure. And, and I look back on that and I just can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, at that I moment. I wouldn't have the energy anymore, I don't think, you know, to do something There was something a commitment like from all you folks, really. Yeah. Uh, okay, sure. Just a moment. We got a, a young lady that just arrived. Uh, she'd like to identify herself and, and where she's from, her address, and also what she was doing on 9-11, the moment that the planes were hitting the towers. Okay, uh, historic date. My name is Kathy Pierce. I lived in Cleveland, Cleveland for 22 years, and I'm still part owner in the Red Arrow Schoolhouse down in Hika Bay. Okay. And uh, on 
2005, I'd just come back from Cuba and I was traveling out to Cleveland when I heard about the planes and okay. came right here and I went to Marie Pfeiffer's house and watched it on the TV with her. Okay, very good, thank you. We have a young lady with a question. Go right ahead, please. My name is Kathy Sixel, and at one time, wasn't the highway supposed to be uh, go more toward Keel? And then Ed Klesik also uh, opposed that, right? And stopped that because they would be going to through too much recreational land or uh, messing up the birds and the bees, right? So then it was um, shifted down to here. So what, what you, the fight really was all about, you wanted to stop the highway, period. We got a young lady here who has been presented with a question and she'd like to identify herself, please. Kate Schutte. Uh, the, the corridor was I-57 was the, the, it was to be on Highway 57, which runs through Plymouth.